Hey guys and good morning. It's Thursday and we had a very short night because last night we came home from Amman pretty late and I still wanted to add the video of course for you guys to YouTube. So short night and today we're actually going to visit our friends from Sony and we're going to show you that of course in today's episode. But first I want to talk about something else. As you can see in this video the quality is different because today I'm switching back to my Sony RX100 MK3. So the MK5 we actually used for a few weeks and Sony lent it to us to do a review on it and to hear my experience and I want to share that experience with you. So let's take a small look at how the RX100 Mark V looks. Okay so here we have the camera and if you don't see a difference between the Mark 3, 4 and 5 don't worry because it actually looks pretty much the same. It's the same housing and it's very compact, it's a really cool camera. You have the flip up screen of course on the back, all the settings in the dial and it's just a pretty good camera. So what is my opinion on it? When I started doing the vlog I actually started with my iPhone. And when I filmed normal material, I used the front of the iPhone and it gave great image quality. And when I did this part, I actually had to use, yeah, the front camera. And that's absolutely not something you want to share online. Well, it's okay, but it's not a great quality. The image stabilization in the iPhone is pretty good. The audio was okay, but it wasn't something where you go like, yeah, this is cool to do. We had an RX100 uh, Mark III and some of the guys online actually gave me the tip why don't you use that camera for your vlogging and I started using it and I have to be totally honest with you guys we got the Mark III for the very simple reason I don't always want to walk around with a big camera and the RX100 is without a doubt a dream of a camera you just put it in your pocket you walk around and you can take great images is it as good as the 42 megapixel Sony a7R2? No, of course not. But it's very, very good. Now, normally you take pictures with your iPhone, but with the RX100 cameras, you actually have something that will fit your pocket and will give you a tremendous quality jump over your iPhone. But I never thought about using it for filming, and that's when I started using it for the vlog. And my whole opinion changed on that camera. Where the camera actually was a camera that I used sometimes, it started to become the camera I'm using all the time. For my vlogging, I started to take a lot more pictures with it and I absolutely loved it. So, where does the Mark V come in? One of the things that's very important in your video quality is lighting, as you can see here. I'm pretty dark, right? Now, you can change this on the fly with these kind of cameras by just pressing down. And let me see, let's raise the exposure compensation, there we go, much better. Of course you can use proper lighting like loom cubes or LED panels, for example from LEDGO, but most of the time with vlogging you have to do with what you got. And this is where these cameras are actually pretty good. They have a low noise floor and the audio is okay. But is it really worth around 1000 euros? And indeed you heard it correctly, these cameras retail in the Netherlands for about 1000 euros. The cool thing is Sony also keeps their older versions on the market. So you can still buy a Mark III, a Mark II I think even and of course the Mark IV which are much cheaper. But is it really worth the money? It's always a personal question if something is worth the money. For me for the vlogging, yes of course, but I don't earn any money from the vlog, so it's always a choice. On the other hand, having a camera with me that great, takes great images all the time and I don't have to drag my big camera with me, big plus, especially when traveling. If you travel, would you leave your DSLR at home and bring this camera? It depends on your personal preference of course. For me I will always bring my DSLR for the very simple reason I just love to have quality and I want the maximum quality. For most consumers I think it's very wise to just leave the big camera at home and bring this camera because you have an amazing Zeiss quality lens, the high ISO is great and of course you don't have to drag around a lot of stuff and it also has a pop-up flash. Is the camera perfect? 
And of course the answer is no. No camera is perfect. And one of the things that I really miss about the Sony is connectivity. When you look over here, I, let me see if it focuses. There we go. You have the connector for HDMI and you have a multi-connector. Now, when I do my vlogs, you hear my audio, right? And the audio you hear is actually through the microphones. And there are and there are two microphones on the Sony A uh, sorry, on the Sony RX100. And those microphones are okay. But when you're outside or you're talking to people, you would like to have that close mic quality. In other words, when we do Digital Classroom or any other show, we actually use lavalier mics or zoom recorders so we can actually have better audio quality. With the RX series, no luck. There's no external mic options. Now, the cameras nowadays have Wi-Fi, Bluetooth. Why didn't Sony put some option in there that you can actually use, for example, a Bluetooth microphone or whatever option over Wi-Fi or make something pro proprietary? I hope I pronounced that correct, but something that's brand specific. I, I don't care what it is. And how much extra money is it to make a headphone jack? Okay, sorry, Apple iPhone, but you know what I mean, right? So for a vlogging camera, having an external mic input is very important. Looking at the price tag of about 1000 euros, I think there should be a mic input. So, is my review positive or negative? If you already own an MK3, you are stuck with 180p for video quality. For YouTube and vlogging, that's okay. But I think in nowadays world, you really, really should consider shooting something in 4K. Not because the quality is better on YouTube, but for the very simple reason you can crop and of course, well, the quality is better on YouTube because YouTube supports 4K. There are also a lot of monitors out there nowadays that actually support 4K. Uh, think about the 4K IMAX, the 5K monitors, uh, BenQ has a 4K monitor, so 4K is here to stay. In other words, if you have a video camera that does 4K, you know for sure that people see all the nice details. And you know you have to shave, right? So, yeah, that's one of the disadvantages of 4K. And because I'm now shooting 180p, I look way better. Less detail. So, 4K, yes. And because Sony still sells the MK4s, which is also 4K, you should consider actually using your money to buy the version 4. Now, how much difference is there between the version 4 and version 5? Let's look at some of the specs. Now you won't see a bump in um, megapixels and high dynamic range performance. And I have to be honest, I already love the images of the MK3. And the MK5 actually looks a little bit better in low noise, but overall the images look pretty similar. Now if you're into video, that's where the difference comes in, of course, compared to the 3. But compared to the 5, uh, sorry, compared to the 4, all those numbers, there's also a big difference because the buffer is bigger, so now you can shoot slow motion way longer. Now, 4K is limited to 5 minutes, and this is something I didn't know, and I actually started running into immediately when I started using the camera because I wanted to do a long Q&A, and I got these messages on my screen the camera is overheating. As soon as you know this, now normally we never talk for five minutes, so I actually only experienced that the first day, so that's not really a big deal. But I have to be honest, on the MK3, I didn't get that message at all, ever. But in all honesty, I never did a five minute talk on the MK3. So, yeah. The 4 also is a little bit slower in out of focus, and the 5 really beats that one. And there's a lot of different stuff, like you can shoot bigger buffers, you can shoot 24 frames a second in photography, not in video. And that's almost video, because 24 frames a second is actually video. So there's a lot of difference in speed, out of focus, and video, like slow motion, you can do now twice as long. If you use the camera for vlogging and you don't use a lot of slow motion, you don't use that burst rate, is it worth upgrading? Well, that's up to you. For me personally, I would love to go to 4K for the vlog. So that means that I would probably be looking at an MK4 instead of the MK5 because I don't need all that extra speed. And you still save a few hundred dollars or euros. And that's of course always 
a gift if you earn money for stuff that you don't need. So it will vary per photographer or per video guy or girl if they like the 4 or the 5. For me it's very simple. If you want 4K performance, I don't think you can get any better than the Sony. The only thing that I don't like is actually the input. I would love to have separate audio, but that's about it. The image quality is great, it fits in my pocket, I bring it with me everywhere. We use the pop-up flash sometimes, the pop-up flash. And of course the video is awesome, great image stabilization and the flip-up screen makes it really really easy to do my vlogs and see what I'm doing. So overall I'm very very enthusiastic about the MK5, without any doubt check it out if you're in the market for a very compact camera, this could be the best compact camera on the market. And don't trust me on it, because if you look on the internet a lot of people are saying exactly the same thing, this thing is crazy good. So check out the MK5 if you're in the market for a new camera for vlogging or for casual photography or if you don't want to drag your DSLR everywhere with you. So that's the review for now and I want to show you a little trick about the pop-up flash by the way. Okay so here you see the pop-up flash on the MK5 and of course it's aimed directly at your subject which well overall doesn't give you the best quality of lighting of course. The cool trick is you can also do this and aim the strobe a little bit up. This means that you actually can use bounce flash. Now don't expect too much from it because of course the power isn't that big but if you're in an area where there's a, a low ceiling and the ceiling is wide this little trick can actually give you a much better quality of light for your images. So we always call this the Wally flash by the way because it looks like Wally but it's a really cool trick just aim it towards the ceiling and you have bounce flash. The other thing is the flip up screen as you can see here. Now when I turn the camera on you can actually see that I see myself. And this is really cool when you do vlogs with this camera for the very simple reason you can now see what you're doing, you talk towards the screen and that's way better than just guessing where the frame is. So this makes this camera amazingly good for vlogging and that's the reason I'm using it. Oh and one final thought about the MK5 and this is something that really frustrates me sometimes. As soon as I got the camera, and this is now about two weeks ago, I of course wanted to see the RAW files. No luck. For the very simple reason Lightroom didn't support the RAW files yet. And I was going like, you know what, maybe in a week. It's now been two weeks and Lightroom still doesn't support the RAW files. So if you want to see the RAW files you have to use Capture One. And luckily Capture One for Sony users is totally free. So. I wish Lightroom would support it because as I mentioned many times before Lightroom is where my images live. This is where I use my catalogs, my smart albums and everything else. Capture One is my raw developer. This is where I do my raw developing, do my final touch ups etc. But still I want to be able to see my raw files in Lightroom. So if Adobe is listening support the MK5 and do it fast. Because we want to see those gorgeous images also in Lightroom. Hey, I promised you guys to bring you with us to Sony, but we actually just got a phone call that our contact person has fallen ill. So we're not going to go to Sony today, but we're going to do that next week. Actually Sony is coming here. And that means that now I have some time to do the images from Sunday from our workshop at the Honig location for Photics. But I'm also doing something else and I want to show you that very quickly. Now recently our friends from MacFun released something called Luminar. And at first I didn't know what to think about this plugin because it's a collection of a lot of settings and it works with workflows and it, I don't know, I, I love Intensify and Tonality and I just didn't get the whole idea of Luminar. But the more I played with it the more I liked it and I want to show you very quickly and of course this is via this camera so it's a little bit more shaky what I'm doing at the moment. Uh, as you can see here I'm actually working on an image from Nadine. But I'm actually tinting everything, uh, adding some grain. Let me see if you can see this here. There we go. And the cool thing about Luminar is that you can actually add filters. So we have this workspace which is now on custom, as you can see here. And I've added all these filters and I'm just playing with the different settings. 
which I'm gonna store as presets. And I've been playing with Lumina for a few days now and I already created a few workflows which is uh, for example for detail enhancements or black and white or more creative stuff and I'm now into creating some presets with different looks. So very soon you will see a package released uh, via MacFun and of course our own site with some stuff from Luminar because as soon as I got the idea behind Luminar I'm incredibly enthusiastic about this plugin. It's and it's also standalone by the way. It's absolutely amazing and it will well, it takes away the need for tonality and intensify actually because all those filters are already inside here and a lot more. So, I will continue building my presets and after that I will show you some results from the shoot with Nadine at the Honig facility. Okay, let's show you some stuff that I already created in Luminar and still we're working on this so a lot more presets will follow. But I've created one in black and white and I hope you can see it on the little camera. And one with a little bit more cooldown. A little bit more over the top creative. And as you can see Lumina really works pretty fast and you have this whole array of settings. So we have tonality, we have a tinting program, a really nice black and white converter, uh, creative tools. It's a really really cool plugin. One with the crane. So really like this and by the way let me go to this one and show you how the original image looks. So this is the original and as you can see it really makes a huge difference. So I'm gonna continue building some of these presets and you're gonna see them probably in a week or two because if I do something I really want to give you guys a lot of presets and not just a few. Okay, let me quickly, sl quickly show you how the workspaces work. Now you see all these filters here and what I can actually do is select a workspace and go for example in detail enhancements and now I have a totally different workspace so now I can work on my detail enhancements and this is really powerful because now you actually can create your own plugin so it's of course all in Luminar but in essence by creating these settings you are in fact creating your own plugins with a lot of different options. So you can run Luminar several times on one image, one time for example for tinting, one time for black and white conversion and for example also for detail enhancements like I'm gonna do now. I'm done retouching the images from the Photix Pro Tour. On all these images I used a new Luminar from MacFun and that's also why all the images have a slightly different look because I'm experimenting with different looks and of course creating presets. So this is the first one. We shot this series with the Indra from Photix and I love working a little bit under angle to give it a little bit more contrast. This is actually not a blue gel but it's an effect I found in Luminar that I absolutely love. So we call it, I believe, uh, slightly more blue. So you will find that you will find that in the presets I'm creating for Luminar, and we hope to release that as mentioned before within a few weeks. Love this one, low angle, little bit of motion, and these were shot with the Mitros Plus, so small flash. And as you can see, we use one normal strobe with actually the Frank Doro flash bender and a strip on Nadine's face, and one red gel from the back giving a really cool shot. Loads and loads of reds and I love reds. Now this is something I never did before. We used the same grid and strip on Nadine's face but this glow it's like she's standing actually on a little bit of fog of red stuff and what I did is underneath the lens what you don't see is here there's actually a strobe aimed upwards with a red gel so that creates that effect. Okay, so these are the images and I hope you like them.